in Sabbath schools, right? There wasn't this many people in Sabbath schools. So what's going on here? You had other Sabbath schools? Okay. But yeah, go to those Sabbath schools. These things are fantastic. Uh, um, uh, I always say iron sharpens iron. Amen? In fact, I was over in, uh, where was it? Uh, Las Vegas. And I was helping this blind lady. And this uh, neighbor of hers was moving into a house right next door to her. And she needed help moving. And I told her, I said, well, I got a van. I can help you move. And uh, so I volunteered. I started hauling stuff for her. She had more cases and cases of books than anybody I'd ever met. And I'm like, oh, great. What did I get myself into, you know? <laughs> and uh, I mean, piles and piles. And, and I looked at a lot more Bibles and Christian books and everything. And then I look in her house, and she had a pulpit in her house. And yeah, I found out that she was pastoring one church and co-pastoring another church in Las Vegas. And ran into her a couple more times at, uh, at this blind lady's house. And, and we, uh, you know, passed a lot of scriptures back and forth. And we'd be talking, you know, Bible study. And she knew I was a Seventh-day Adventist. And so we were always talking scriptures and stuff anytime we ran into each other. And, uh, and then she had Bibles that were more worn out than I've ever seen in a Seventh-day Adventist church before. Yeah, and you know, that's really tough to do. In fact, mine's almost broke. i got to get another one. Um, <laughs> this one, yeah. Um, and, and, and so one day I was sitting there across from her, and I looked at her, and I said, you know what? I said, with all your knowledge of the Bible, I can't believe you don't honor the Sabbath. She kind of looks at me. I looked at myself. I was like, did I just say that? <laughs> Is this not something that I could just blurt out and say like that? And, and, uh, but it kind of got to her. Uh, she did a little homework, and I sent her some, uh, I, I, got, I printed off some uh, uh, scriptures and websites to go to and stuff. She went back to her Hungarian language, found out in Hungary, it's Thursday, Friday, Sabbath. There's not even another name for it, like we call it Saturday in America. It's Thursday, Friday, Sabbath. And uh, she found all these other countries. And so she really came to grips with it. I started taking her to Sabbath schools. I started taking her to uh, prayer meetings and Sabbath services. And, uh, and she ended up quitting pastoring those, seven, those churches and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah. And she had a full-time medical career, you know. So, um, But then, uh, what was it, a couple of years ago, the uh, churches that she was going to asked her to come back and speak. And she's like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll be glad to. And uh, she's been going back there on Sundays, preaching and stuff. And people are like, where are you getting all this depth of knowledge? And she's talking to them about the Sabbath and the state of the dead and all these things, scripture, scripture, scripture. And, and she just has her quarterly with her. <laughs> That's where she gets a lot of her sermons from for the Sunday. And the one church just started the Sabbath service. And she thinks both churches are going to end up being plant churches for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and she's doing, she's actually setting up a new plant church. She's doing prison ministries, and she's ahead of the prison ministry for Nevada uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then she's uh, doing a, a homeless ministry, too, street ministry. So, yeah, and so you never know who that one person is you're going to be, amen? You know, you just got to get out there and uh, open your mouth, speak to people. Uh, let me start with prayer, though. Let me start with prayer. Oh, Lord. Oh, Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us together. Lord, we need you in so many ways. Lord, we come to you asking for your forgiveness. And we know you're a righteous and just God that forgives us of our sins. And, uh, Father, we just want to be in a position and condition to be in your holy presence, to receive your blessings, and to draw ever closer to you. And Lord, I do ask that you will use me as I surrender to you today, be the words that you need spoken. We just thank you so much for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah, you got to stay in prayer. That's a big thing. <laughs> See, even he agrees. She agrees. That's right. Um, uh, let me see, Jer no, not Jeremiah. I'm going to have to do that scripture, though. Um, 1 Kings 14.8, though. Let me go 1 Kings 14.8. Um, 1 Kings 14.8. And here we go, here we go. This is God talking, 1 Kings 14.8. And it says, And tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to you. And yet you have not been as my...
my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart, only to do what was right in my eyes. Excuse me? God is saying that David kept all his commandments? Wasn't David an adulterer and a murderer and a few other things? Three times it says that in the Bible. When I see stuff three times, I really pay attention. And it, this happened after David had died. And if you remember right, David was always running to the Lord, wasn't he? Asking for forgiveness and pleading and begging with the Lord. And it just goes to show you that God not only forgives us of all of our sins, he literally forgets every one of our sins. Amen? Amen. We've got an awesome God. That's one of the mysteries of God, that he literally forgets every one of your sins. And the only person that's going to bring up those sins of the past, that's Satan, saying you're not good enough. Remember? Remember this? Remember that? But we've got a stronger God than that. So we can walk forward with bold steps, knowing that we have been forgiven. And God wants us to start a fresh start every single day with him. So, amen. Oh, there was a scripture I want to read here. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Let me go Jeremiah 17. i got to have a scripture today. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, and will not fear when he comes. But his leaves will be green, and will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Amen? Amen. I'm telling you, I, I'll talk about my culinary career tomorrow. Yeah, I was one of the youngest executive chefs ever in Nevada, doing big, big events, uh, sometimes 30,000 people, you know, for one event, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, what happened was I, I got to do a lot of celebrity catering, I opened up my own catering company. I've had my license for years and years now. And uh, my whole thing was to do these celebrity catering jobs, and sometimes there would be thousands of people even at those events, too. And uh, business was so good that I actually went and applied for my liquor and gaming license. And I got it. Yeah, now it takes a lot to get a liquor and gaming license in the back. You've got a, all these FBI background checks, the application fees alone are ex really expensive. But I funded everything myself with no partners. And then after they do all the FBI background checks, you have to appear in front of the review board. Now the review board, basically what you do is you go in front of that gaming commission and you confess your sins. That's what you do. I couldn't believe some of the people that were getting gaming licenses. With the crimes that they were doing, as long as they confess their sins, the gaming review board will be like, we have abolished you of all your sins, so you're free to go out and have your gaming license. <laughs> yeah! I mean, they were doing some serious crimes. But if you uh, did something, even if it was as petty as a traffic ticket, and you did not tell them about it, and they found out, they will deny your license, and you got to start all over again. That's the way it works, and... Uh, um, so anyway, I got my liquor and gaming license. I opened up a casino. Uh, it wasn't one of the big ones like you'd see on television, but, you know. Um, do you have casinos around here? I don't even know. No? Don't, don't get them. Don't get them. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, so I opened up a casino. Uh, but it was a pretty good size one. My, my dance floor was the size of this room. And my stage was definitely bigger than this stage. And you could come in my place at 11 o'clock at night, and I'd have more people in my casino than you have them here right now. So, I mean, it was a, it was a pretty busy, hopping place, and, and it was the, the hot spot for all the locals, all the seniors, uh, not the seniors, but all the police officers, security, um, the FBI agents, CIA, you know, that was their hangout, all the government, because um, I had the best food in town. And, uh, but if you have security, like all the police officers that were in there day and night, I had all the uh, girls that worked the nightclubs. 
they would always be in there because they felt safe. And if you got the girls, you got the guys. So it was really a perfect mix for Las Vegas. That place was packed all the time. And I'll tell you what, those slot machines make a lot of money. Oh, I mean, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you pull $20,000 out of a slot machine for one week. I mean, they can make a lot of money. Um, and, of course, my job ended up being where I would go to other properties and entice people to come to my property. You know, I had a full-time crew, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, for every single department. And, uh, but I got to go to the different casinos, sit down next to those dollar players. I'd go right next to the dollar players and uh, play the machines and give them free meal tickets to come to my property and get them over. And more often than not, there they'd be at my property. And, uh, of course, now I was raised Catholic, okay? And uh, um, I left the church as soon as I left home, which 92% uh, of the kids actually leave the church within two years of leaving home. And that's the Barna Group studies of all religions. 92% leave the faith. That's just the way it is. And uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, I still felt like God had purpose for me. And, of course, here I am in the middle of Sin City in the business. And, you know, God kept impressing on me, saying, Mark, I don't want you in this business. And uh, I, I'm telling you, I had moms coming in with their half-naked kids looking for their boyfriends or husbands who were blowing the paychecks in the slot machines. And they'd have that tone, and they'd be walking in there and be like, oh, boy, here we go again. And uh, we'd take the kids away and put them in the kitchen, and we had a table in there. And my whole crew was trained how to deal with this. This is how often it happened. And, and men, too, they'd be coming in looking, their wives would be blowing paychecks. And they'd do that before they even go home and beat the kids. Usually the kids are starving, you know, because they haven't even had a meal. And, uh, you know, God's just impressing on me. My problem was that I was not listening to God. And, uh, one, one kid, he did an armed robbery the day after he blew his paycheck in the slot machines. And my bartender showed me the article in the paper. And I'm just like, you know, what are you supposed to do? And, and God just kept impressing on me and impressing on me. And I just knew that God had something better in store for me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the problem. See, if you look up the word listen in the dictionary... One of the definitions of the word listen is actually obedience. Okay? That's one of the actual definitions. See, there's a lot of people listening to God with their ears, but they're not listening to God with their actions. And that's where we need to be. We need to start listening to God with our actions, doing what God wants us to do. Amen? Uh, first, uh, no, it's uh, James 1.22, I believe. James 1.22, be ye not just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Amen. And here I am in the middle of this business and I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. And God's impressing on me. And I don't care how far you are down in the pits and down in that drain. God's got a long enough arm to pull you out of it. And he did. He was not going to give up on me and he's not giving up on any single one of you in here either. And he's not giving up on anybody out there. Doesn't matter what you're doing. He will never, ever, ever, ever give up on you. All he's doing is waiting for you to accept him. And the more I started seeing this, I had one couple, they would sign markers for, you know, uh, money, and $200 here, $300 here. By the end of the day, they may have lost a couple thousand dollars. And the next morning, the banks open up, and they pay me, start gambling again. They lost everything they had. They lost their retirement. Their entire life savings. They lost their home. They lost their vehicles. They left town in a beat up pickup truck with a camper topper on the back. That's all they had left. You know, and I had other casino owners call me up saying, Mark, have you seen these people? I said, Yeah, yeah, they skipped town. And they were like, Well, they owe us money. I was like, Well, yeah, they owe me money too, but I didn't care. I mean, it wasn't like the money left the building. You know, you, I could give every one of you $100 to play a slot machine. It goes right in the slot machine. They never left the building. I can pull it out and give it to you again. Now you owe me 200 
I actually want as many people playing on markers as I can. Because if you win, you got to pay me first. So now the winnings off those slot machines stay in the property. They don't leave the door. It's all strategy. It's all business. How to keep the money in the house. You know, this is what's going on there. When they started allowing the uh, credit card machines in the, in the slot casinos, I was there. And they could swipe cards, and my bartender would give people money. You know, if you wanted $100 off your credit card, no problem to play the slot machines. And uh, people did it all the time, swiping their credit cards for slot machine money. And uh, this one lady, she was with my bartender. And I didn't think nothing of it when she swiped $100 bills, you know. But then when, when, when uh, I was back behind the bar doing a liquor count, she was there one day saying, hey, can you get $10 off this credit card? And then she was trying, you know, said, well, how about five? Try to get $5 off. It. She was trying every credit card in her purse, trying to get $5 to play a slot machine. I mean, isn't that horrible? Well, that's nothing compared to finding her with a bullet in her head, committing suicide, and orphaning three kids. That's what that business does. Rob, kill, destroy. I mean, how do you think it felt to be at that funeral and everyone pointing the finger saying, hey, I know where the money went. You know, I never went to a funeral. And I said, am I getting that desensitized by this industry that I never went to a funeral? You, know, you don't get casino owners at funerals. It's not our job to wonder where the money's coming from or what's happening to the people when they leave. You know, but God was just saying, Mark, it's time for you to get out of this business. And I prayed and prayed. I was like, Lord, whatever it takes, just you know, put me in something else. I know you've got better things in store than me. And when my lease was up, I said, it's time to go. And I had enough money if I need to take three or four or five years off of work, get in the line of work, whatever I wanted to do. And uh, so I got out of that business, and I've never been back since. Amen. And I'll tell you what, I'm, t I'm telling you, you know, when you start listening to God, doing what he wants you to do, then he can really start working with you. Amen. And I'll tell you, I ended up getting married, okay? <laughs> I thought I married Miss Wright, but I did not know her first name was always. <laughs> Yeah, I married Miss Always Right. And, uh, funny part was, when the money was gone, so was she. You never know. And I'll tell you what, the closer I was getting to God, the more I was reading, the more I was praying, the farther away she was getting from me. You ever notice that? And I, and I thought things were fine. I mean, I always held her hand, because I knew if I didn't, she'd be out there spending money. You know, but, uh, and she was really good at saving money. I mean, she'd save a hundred dollars on that new pair of shoes, and you know, she'd save she saved a couple thousand dollars on a new car, and uh, she saved ten thousand dollars on a house for her parents. I mean, almost saved me right into bankruptcy is what she almost did, and um, I ended up so broke that I ended up living in my car for a couple months until I could get a couple paychecks and, and get back on my feet, and. Um, but yeah, as soon as, as soon as the money was gone and I was getting closer and closer to Christ, she just, you know, went the opposite direction. And and see, you know, the funny part is, you know, God tests a lot of people this way. He tests a lot of people through their prosperity and a lot of people he tests through their poverty. And, you know, people that got all the money in the world, they're like, what do I need God for? I got everything I need. The, the, the richest areas do the least amount of tithing. They have the least amount of churches because that's just the way it is. You know, and here's the other side. When people hit rock bottom, they give up on God. They're like, okay, we tried it your way, God. That didn't work out. That's what they do. They were testing God in a way they shouldn't be testing God. And I knew God was humbling me. I knew I was going through that process there. And instead, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to get even closer to Christ in everything I do. I took the opposite direction. And I'll tell you what I started doing. I started spending time on my knees every single day. And 15 minutes on your knees every single morning. That is 1% of your day. And if you will just start spending 1% of your day with Christ every morning, he'll change your life. 
Just 1%. And it doesn't happen after a day or a week. It was month after month after month of being on my knees, year after year. Studying the Bible every day, reading the Bible, doing the homework. You know, read more, study more, and pray more. That's what we need to do. You know, right now, they did a new thing called uh, a Twitter. Twitter has six-second videos now. Yeah, you don't get seven seconds or eight seconds. All you get is six seconds for a video to get your message out there. That's how fragmentized our world is nowadays. It takes more than six seconds to read this, okay? It does. You have to spend... God could have created this world in six seconds, but he decided to take his time and do it in six days. We've got to take the time reading the Bible. It is so important. You know, so here I am in Vegas, you know, and I'm starting to flip. I, I went to over 200 churches in Las Vegas. I've been to every single denomination you could think of, over 200 churches in over quite a few years, and I could not find a decent church. They were all just teaching a couple of verses of the Bible. They weren't teaching the whole message. Uh, we call them two-verse Charlies, because that's what they do. Two verses of the Bible, that's all they go by. And uh, I know pastors that actually have cocktails at the bar with the congregation before service. Whatever sins you want, Vegas has a church for it. I have found them. Oh, I'm talking serious sins, too. And they'll justify it every way they can. Um, some of the uh, casinos have churches in the casinos. And it's not the kind that you get married at, not the cute little chapels. You know, um, they're actual churches that rent out parts of casinos. And, I, yeah, I had one pastor, an uh, article in the paper, that he actually gives classes on how to play slot machines after service. Like, excuse me, I've talked to the man. And he justifies it with the Bible. He says, well, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. So if you're not winning on the slot machines, you're not doing something right with God. Maybe you need to tie me a little more money. I couldn't believe it. So finally, I quit going to church altogether. I said, that's it. I am not going to church. And for the next, I don't know, three years, I never went to church. But I stayed in study. I stayed in prayer every single day. And then all of a sudden, I'm going through the television, and I run across 3 a.m. And I'm watching, and I'm like, they're teaching the whole message. And the more I'm watching, I'm like, looking for errors, you know, and I can't find them. You know, and, and I started going to, so I went over to Paradise Church in Las Vegas. Kind of the same style church, you know, multicultural, and it's just, in Vegas, it's that way. And, uh, you know, just a great family church, and I knew that God wanted something from me, and I knew he wanted me there. And um, so I just, and I started sending donations to 3ABN, you know, I was like, you guys are doing such a good job. Here, take some money and keep going. And, um, and then uh, I got a phone call from 3ABN and said, hey, why don't you come over and do a cooking show? And I was like, sure, I can cook. I'll, I'll come over. So I went over there and did a few shows and a few more. And, uh, and then six years ago, I just got baptized by Jim Gilley over at 3ABN. Yeah, and all the 3ABN was doing was validating what I had already known. I, I knew about the Sabbath. My brother's married to a Jewish girl. And I always wondered why people didn't honor it on Saturday like they should. Uh, but yeah, everything started clicking, you know. And people, all oh, people come up to me in Vegas, and they're like, Mark, you were making that kind of money in, the, in those slot machines? Man, you need to get back in that business. You can do a lot of good with that money. And I just look at them, and I'm like, why would I ever go back to Egypt when I see the promised land right in front of me? Amen? We are this close to the promised land. There's no turning back. In fact, we need to give God more than 10%. You know, the problem is people are holding back 10% of their sin. Oh, well, I'm only going to the bar about once a month now. I cut back. You know, oh, I only lie half the time. You know, we need to start giving God 100% of everything we have. That little 10% is going to come back and bite you with a vengeance. You know, we need to eliminate that 10%. Are you going to accept a spouse if you're going to get married? Are you looking for a partner who's only going to give you 50%? Are 
I mean, would you put up with a spouse that's cheating on you 30% of the time? I mean, aren't we supposed to be preparing ourselves as the bride for Christ? We need to take this a lot more seriously than we are. I mean, time is too, too short. And I know a lot of people out there saying, well, I got God as my co-pilot. If God is your co-pilot, switch seats with him, okay? Allow him to start being the pilot, guiding that plane and guiding your life to where he wants you to go. That's the way we need to approach this thing. Put God first in everything. Put God in everything. We need to be a better idea. I'm telling you, and Vegas is just... I can't even show you the billboards. <coughs> they got, there's some billboards there that say, don't believe the truth. That's all it says. Not even a company name. There's other ones that say, obey the serpent. This is Vegas. And luck is everywhere. Luck, luck, luck. You can't go to the bathroom in Vegas without somebody wishing you good luck. I mean, it's Vegas. It's just the way it is. Um, uh, but luck was derived from Lucifer, luck, Lucifer, to take favor away from God. How come every time something good happens in your life, it was luck? But every time something bad happens in your life, oh, that was from God. That was meant to be. Excuse me? If something good happens in your life, we need to give God the praise and glory and thanks. Amen? Not be calling it luck. And if something bad happens in your life, I guarantee you Satan had something to do with it. Now, I didn't see in the flyer in the bulletin here, but we might have to change the name Potluck. We might have to start calling it a fellowship meal. I mean, I'm from Vegas, but I don't want to roll the dice on my meal, okay? You know, maybe we should call it Fellowship Meal from now on. And, uh, but yeah, you'll find that everywhere. And, uh, it, it, but I'm a true believer in Romans 8, 28. All things work for the greater good. You know, if you're serving the Lord, whatever happens, if you lose a loved one or lose a limb or lose a child, whatever it is, take it to the cross. And God will turn it into something even better. And I know sometimes it's hard to understand it in the beginning, but as time goes on, you will realize that. I have a lady in Vegas. She lost a leg and all the toes on her other foot. And I had to witness to her for uh, uh, probably two years. And when she was in the hospital, I mean, I was calling her every day. She is so inspired and on fire for the Lord. She opened up a ministry. It's called Amputee Ministry. And she's affiliated with the entire United States amputee system. Anytime somebody loses a limb in Nevada, she gets the call and she goes and witnesses to them. You know, and she's on fire. She is on fire for the Lord. You know, so it's amazing what God can do when you really start serving Him. So, yeah, be careful out there because Satan turns things so slowly, nobody notices it. Just like luck, everything's turned so slowly that he, you know, nobody notices. Um, hope. That, I was going to talk about that hope in the scripture there. Satan, literally, Satan puts people in a state of hope. We've got to be careful with this hope situation. Um, because hope is uh, uh, not always a good thing. Hey, I turned right to it here. Hope. These are definitions of hope in the Bible. Okay? you got to get this. you really got to get this. Because this is going to blow you away. Um, trust, confidence, feel safety, security. Faith and hope. Uh, there's some pretty good ones here, you know. Safety, assurance, uh, to trust in. There's some longer ones, too. Um, now, these are definitions of hope in the Bible, too. Uh, without care. Carelessness is the definition of hope. To be careless. To attach oneself. The folly of relying upon any other type of security, strongly contrasted with depending on God alone. Uh, here's another definition. One who is overconfident and shows no caution whatsoever. These are definitions of hope in the Bible. My favorite one, an express sense of resignation. There is nothing more one can do. Now that sounds like hopelessness to me, doesn't it? Not hope. So you've got to understand, there's a big difference between hope be 
being a noun. Our hope is Jesus Christ. And hope being a verb, which is an earthly, ungodly hope. Okay, there's a huge difference. But Satan has just bundled it all together into one big package. So that the entire society and all the mainstream, you'll see the pastors are like, all you need is hope and everything's going to be fine. Let's everybody chant on getting hope. That's what they're doing out there. Now, if you look at uh, uh, it, hope being a form of insanity, you're going to think a little different about this. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over but expecting a different result. That's what people are doing with hope today. They're hoping for the same thing over and over but expecting a different result. They're hoping that economies change. They're hoping that administrations can do something. They're hoping they get a job with ever, without ever actually applying for a job. They're hoping their lives will change without doing something. Jesus did not come and say, let us hope together. Jesus said, come let us reason together, okay? Christ wants action in your lives. He wants to be doing things in your lives. He wants to be moving every step with you. Can you understand this? I mean, is there going to be hope in heaven? No. It's because we're going to have our hope fulfilled in heaven. And see, that's the way we need to be here on earth right now, is having our hope fulfilled, knowing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Not wondering if he's a Lord and Savior. And then we can walk out these doors with that bright, shining confidence, knowing that we have our hope fulfilled. People are going to look at you and they're going to be like, I don't know what it is about that person. They're going to look at this congregation and say, I want some of that. You know, it's getting dark out there. It's getting really, really dark. And now's the time for us to shine the brightest. But we can't shine the brightest unless we have our hope fulfilled. Knowing that Christ is here with you, walking every step of the way with you. That's what it takes. You know, and, and just to correct, I got to do this. I got to do this just for fun. <laughs> in, the, in the quarterly today, I love correcting things. Um, Hosea 12.6, it says, this is the NIV version, but you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. Now, if you go to the original text, it doesn't say wait for your God. It says wait on your God. And if you look at the original version, it says serve your Lord. So this is the exact opposite of what we're supposed to be doing for the kingdom. There's too many people out there. That's just the NIV version. Which usually is pretty correct, but that's just one that... Um, see, waiting on the Lord does not mean to sit there and do nothing. We're supposed to wait on the Lord like a waiter or waitress waits on somebody in a restaurant. Doing things with action, serving the Lord. That's what waiting on the Lord means. There's a big difference. We need to be out there doing things. Yeah, it's amazing what's going on out there. Satan just turns things so slowly. So, Anyway, um, take it one step at a time. But make sure every single step you take, you're taking with Christ. You know, and you will be so blessed by it. Uh, and one of the things you can do, one of the best things you can do is pray for discernment. Um, let, me, uh, let me go to this one uh, page here in the Great Controversy, page 595, or those, I don't want to forget this, so, page 595, the multitudes do not want biblical truth, because it interferes with the desires of the sinful, world-loving heart, and Satan supplies the deceptions which they love, but God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and only the Bible as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Satan is now putting forth his utmost effort for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform him marvelous works in our sight, so closely with the counterfeit resemble the truth, that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by holy scriptures. 
None. But those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. That's why this, see this great delusion. It's doing everything from the Sabbath being on Sunday, great delusion, hope, great delusion, grace is another great delusion. We talked about that at the first service. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that grace is a free gift from God. There's a couple new, new versions that try to put that in there, but grace is not the free gift. Christ is the gift that is free. Okay? You do not receive grace as a free gift. You have to understand this. You have to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay? It's conditional. Grace is conditional. You know, nowadays, see what Satan has done is he's twisted it so much that this younger generation actually believes that they have the right to the free gift of grace and never, ever have to do anything about it. They don't think they have to tithe anymore. They don't think they have to go to church anymore. They think they get that grace for free. And this younger generation, they're really going deep because they're demanding their free gift of grace right now. This is what's going on out there. Satan is twisting that. Everything. He does it so slowly, nobody notices this. This is why you have to have discernment. So you can see the little tricks that Satan is pulling on you. He's been doing it over thousands of years. That's why we don't notice these things. But when you pray for discernment, that's when you get godly wisdom, and you get godly knowledge, and you're using God's eyes and God's heart and God's mind instead of your own. Amen. Ellen White talks about discernment more than any other subject in the Bible. Go on her website. You will find row after row after row, page after page after page. That's how important it is to have discernment. That's when you're going to see all these delusions that Satan's putting out there. So pray for discernment. You have to have it. There's a, there's a girl in Vegas. Uh, she's serving a life sentence for murder. Born and raised, seven-day Adventist. Killed a woman and her unborn baby. And uh, so she's serving a life sentence for murder. And uh, somebody, her aunt, called me and wanted me to write her. And I've been writing her for probably about five years now. And I'll tell you, I had to go through every single step with that one person. All about forgiveness and salvation and sanctification. And showing her all over the Bible that you have to do what God is asking you to do. You know, don't expect your salvation you know, you, you appreciate it. you got to humble yourself. I think surrendering daily is one of our most important factors to understand that we're not earning our right into heaven. That's the other extreme, by the way, with grace. Is the, you know, the other extreme, see, Satan don't care what side of the fence you fall off on as long as you fall. Or the path. Satan owns a fence, so stay away from the fence, okay? <laughs> but the path, so. But, um, yeah, she, um, she finally came into convictions about the Sabbath, and came back to the truths of the Bible, and she quit working on Saturday. They put her in a lockdown with 20 other girls. It's like punishment. She stuck to it. God put her in a job working at the loading docks where she could work um, Monday through Friday. And uh, a couple of years ago, she asked her boss if she could bring in a portable baptismal. And there's a pastor from Northern Nevada that comes down too. And uh, they baptized 19 girls in prison. Yeah, yeah they've had half, I don't know how many baptisms. The biggest one had 29 girls. But they have baptisms all the time. They're in prison for these girls. And all these people in prison are testing her character. So she's got to have really strong discernment to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it. You know, she's got to be able, people can hide from her. It's the same thing with us. People are testing our character to see if we're worthy for them to confide in us too. So yeah, pray for discernment. That is so important. All right, I'm going to do a painting here. I can have some fun. Yay. Yeah, you can crank it up too if you want. I'll have some fun here.
you know, I do these events in the smallest of churches. That sometimes they have 10 or 12 people in their congregation. I've done them in uh, uh, gang areas with prison bars on the windows. And, and I've had people that come up to me and they're like, you know, other people that do ministries all over the country and the world. And they're like, Mark, why do you mess with those churches? And I just look at them and I say, well, why don't you? You know, doesn't God want us going everywhere? And he wants every one of us going everywhere too. This is the time for us to be the most excited about what Christ... There's three things you do to be a good Christian. You talk to God, you let God talk to you, and then you tell others about what Christ has done in your life. You talk to God through your prayer. God talks to you through the Bible. He talks to you through um, that still, silent voice that we need to be listening for. And he talks to us through circumstances in a lot of different ways. And then you go out there and just tell people what Christ has done in your life. Being in the kitchen business, the only thing I can say is that, you know, we need to be on fire for the Lord, okay? We need to quit putting God on the back burner. Get Christ front and center. He wants us to be eye to eye with him. Have you ever heard that apple of the eye? The, the small man in the eye? God wants to be that close. You can get that close to somebody where you will see your own reflection in their eye. That's how close God wants to be with us. So we are a direct reflection of him to the community that surrounds us. So, amen. Let me have a prayer. I'll have a closing prayer here. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much, Father. We thank you for the joys that you give us every day in our lives. And yes, we know that Satan is attacking more than ever. In these end days, he's just throwing those arrows out there and he's uh, bigger arrows and more of them. And, and we know we have a strong God that will protect us and provide for us. And, uh, and we know that Satan's just shooting out these arrows because Satan knows his last arrow is soon to be shot. And you're coming forth to take us home for all eternity. And Lord, I do pray that you will continue to guide us and direct us in the directions that you want us to go. Remove our desires. Remove all of our desires and replace them with the desires that you want us to have. So that way we can run it like a race with passion and fire and joy. And Father God, I ask, Lord, that you will take the Sabbath day and not only teach us how to hold it in reverence, but also teach us how to have it as a day of celebration. A mirror image of that thousand year Sabbath celebration that you have waiting in heaven just a few short hours away. So we just thank you so much and love you and can't wait till those trumpets sound for you to bring us all home. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.